of the uh, members of the team that is helping with the study. And uh, tonight we're going to be talking about uh, the study itself, the goals of the study, and also uh, talking a little bit and reiterating uh, the importance of uh, broadband in our everyday life. Um, as I mentioned, I'm Curtis Dean and I'm with uh, Smart Source Consulting and uh, part of the team that's doing this. Uh, I'm over in Grimes, Iowa, so not very far away from you guys. And uh, I used to live in Johnston, so uh, your next door neighbor says hi. Uh, also, uh, who will be participating tonight and providing commentary and, and, and input is Todd Kilkoff. He's with Kilkoff oh. Advisory Services, and Todd is based in Indianola. And then we have um, uh, HR Green is the lead uh, company that is taking the lead on the study. And Ken Demlo is here with HR Green. Um, and so Ken is going to be um, talking a little bit more in depth about the study, what, what the plan is, what the goals are, and then we'll talk a little bit in just a few minutes about, um, about broadband and why it's so important for the area. So that's kind of the agenda for tonight. Uh, we want to let everybody know that if you do uh, have plans to chime in, we would love to hear your input. And in fact, later on, we'll have a hopefully a good Q&A session. So uh, there's going to be a couple of different ways for you to provide that Q&A. Number one, if you would like, you can uh, tap the Q&A um, icon at the bottom of that Zoom screen, and that will bring up a little window where you can type in your question. Uh, we will answer those questions uh, either as we go along or toward the end. So we appreciate questions uh, that you might have. Just put them in there. If you have more of an open-ended comment or uh, uh, anything like that, you could also use the chat window. Um, of course, you can use that for a question as well. And finally, if you want to speak, there's a raise hand function that you'll want to click on. And that way we will understand that you want to speak and um, the folks that are running the webinar tonight will be able to unmute your mic and call on you to say a few words. So uh, without any further ado, we'll kind of get rolling here. Uh, I'm going to hand it off now to Ken, who is going to talk to you on the overall vision of the uh, broadband study that is being undertaken. The city of Johnston engaged us, uh, HR Green, and our fellow uh, consultants, uh, Curtis and Todd, Smart Source, and KS. And there was just wanted to kind of walk through what the scope of the project is and then how what we're doing tonight uh, fits into that. So the first part. We call it phase one is getting to a gap analysis and that's we take an uh, uh, overview look at the market uh, for broadband uh, in in Johnson we look at the uh, existing assets that are already in Johnson what broadband related assets there are we do community engagement and that's where tonight fits in and uh, and then community engagement where uh, we've done a survey and we'll talk more about that later um, but then also having these these uh, these meetings and then we're also looking at broadband related policy and uh, uh, permitting and just seeing how uh, the broadband related, how, how those uh, are set up for broadband and, and uh, for broadband steps. So those things we work on and are working, currently working on right now in phase one, uh, we've done a, a, a beginning look at the market assessment and got some data and, and some of it wasn't particularly clear. So, so we want to keep uh, digging into that. We've uh, been able to, to build uh, GIS, uh, a good set of GIS data for what broadband related assets do exist in the, in the city. Community engagement, uh, this is really important to be able to verify the market assessment, to be able to really get a feel of what's actually going on, uh, you know, down to detail level. And that, that gives us a lot of our info to be able to, to compare and contrast what, uh, what industry things we see. Well, we put all those together, and that leads us to what are gaps in broadband coverage. Um, what are gaps in uh, the broadband availability? What are gaps in, uh, in the quality of service and, and those sorts of things? Again, those are all things we, we work through in the community engagement and the market assessment. And what gaps there could be in, in broadband-related policy to meet the goals of the, uh, of the community or the broadband. So once we get that, that gap analysis pulled together, which again, we're right in the middle of working on that right now, we get that pulled together. And then we start looking at what are the options to fill gaps. And those could take several different uh, different paths. Um, it could be uh, steps that the city might wanna take. It could be P3 means public-private partnerships. It could be uh, working with uh, providers and there are already some uh, of those options on the table and coming to Johnston, um, some already in Johnston. Um, so 
so we'll look at with with what the city might or might not want to do um, with what uh, private partners might want to do or not want to do we start pulling together some options to fill the gaps that we found in phase one and then and then the, we, that all kind of works towards uh, working together on so what is the vision for uh, for Johnston for how to fill any gaps how to address any issues uh, related to broadband um, and then so we get that visioning and then when we put that, that vision document together that gives some insight to the city uh, city leadership on what the issues are what are options to be able to uh, uh, to be able to fill those gaps um, and so, uh, so so that kind of leads all to uh, some end results that we can say okay now what what steps can Johnston take uh, to, to meet those gaps and to improve broadband in the city of Johnston? So, Curtis, that's kind of an overview of where we of the project, where we are in the project. Uh, so at that point, I'll hand it back to you to uh, uh, to, to talk through uh, what the rest of things are going to do tonight. Great. Uh, before I move on, though, I want to I want to hit on a couple of things that you mentioned, Ken. Um, first of all, uh, people in the industry send, tend to use a lot of acronyms, but I just wanted to you to maybe explain to people what GIS is. You talked about gathering GIS data, and that may go over the heads of some of the folks listening tonight. Yeah, great, thank you. So GIS is, is uh, a software that, that communities use, well, a lot of folks use, but uh, it's used in a lot of communities in Johnson uses it. And it, um, that's um, a geographic uh, way of, of looking at, uh, of recording, keeping track of uh, different assets, uh, different, um, uh, uh, and, and we use it like even in the survey that again we'll talk more about that later. But even in the survey, we use it to get all those survey results so we can see on a map where coverage people think coverage is good and where it's bad. Um, and what that does for us in this project is, is is pulling all that data into this this geographic software. We then can take that and say uh, when we're over in phase two because we get all the data together in phase one. In phase two, we can actually say, okay, now let's start connecting the dots. Let's actually start designing some options that the city could use either themselves or working with a, a private partner. Um, and we can actually draw that in and it develops a cost for us. It shows right, you know, it, it gives us a good way of looking at it, but also of analyzing uh, the different options. So it, it kind of, that geographic software works all the way through from collecting the data then to how we can use it to start looking at options to solve problems. And it's real easy because then we can go make any changes if folks have different ideas. So, uh, so it's a, a good way to, to work with the data and then also to show, uh, to show what options there are. Great, fantastic. One other thing I wanted to hit on too, when we're talking about a gap, just so people understand, a gap doesn't necessarily have to mean a gap in availability. Although that's certainly part of it, there may be areas of the community that don't have access to broadband services. But a gap can also consist of other aspects and attributes such as reliability. If you have an internet connection and it is down a lot and unable to be used, you have a reliability gap. And those are the sorts of gaps uh, that I'll, I'll bring that up in a little bit too and talk more about that. Um, so we're not talking just about whether or not there is a wire to your house. We're also talking about how's that wire working for you? Is it providing you the quality of service that you need to do what you were doing? Um, so that just to clarify that a little bit, we'll talk a little bit about that more in a minute. I do want to take a second to recognize uh, some of the VIPs that are on the call tonight. We want to thank uh, the uh, Mayor Dierenfeld, also the uh, Council Member Cope and Martin and Reddy and Soroka. All your council persons and your mayor are on tonight here from Johnston. Uh, also, I believe I saw State Representative Eddie Andrews in the attendance list. So uh, your new state representative for the Johnston area. So uh, thank you to all of those folks for being on. Uh, as I move on here, I'm just going to hit a couple of questions that we've had already. So that's fantastic. Keep them coming in. We'll have some at the end, but we'll also try to answer a few of them as we go along. Um, we had somebody ask, is fiber an option instead of broadband? Well, actually, fiber is a just a mechanism or a medium by which broadband is delivered. So broadband is really what we're talking about is high speed internet, really high speed internet. And that can be delivered over a number of different types of connections. Um, our experience shows that a fiber optic connection is the most capable 
and the most future proof, or at least future future ready. Um, and and so broadband over fiber has some advantages over other types of medium, like as a copper wire or a wireless connection. And so um, really, when fiber is broadband, and broadband isn't always on fiber. So just to clarify that. Um, also, we had somebody asking about the Metronet agreement. Um, Yes, in a way, the uh, visioning study was actually launched before or was planning to get underway before Metronet made the announcement. But obviously, as part of this, we're going to be taking into account their plans to expand and build services in Johnston. So that'll be part of um, the work that uh, Ken and his team are uh, working on. And, and we also had a question about PPPs or public-private partnerships. Ken, you want to maybe address that a little bit? Yeah. So. Um... You know, when it when we find out where those areas of concern and, and Curtis, I appreciate the kind of same gap is more than just you know kind of more explaining that. When we find those areas of of uh, connectivity concerns, whatever those might be, there are always quite a few options as to how to uh, to address those. Um, it could be something that the community decides this is important and we don't see any other way of getting it done, so we'll do it and, and we'll we'll take care of it. But it often it could also be that we'll work with a private provider or private providers. And there's a lot of ways that that can be done. So um, that could be done through um, uh, requests for information where the city says, okay, here we have these issues and we're showing them in the geographic software and and uh, here's some options we think that could could solve resolve those. And you could you know the city could uh, send out a request for information and private partners, private providers could say, okay, here's how we can solve it and the city could choose one. Um, or it could be uh, if um, there's private partners are doing something, the city could work with whoever to do extensions of what they're doing and those kinds of things. So there's there's a lot of ways that those uh, private partner, or private public private partnerships can work. Um, and it really just depends on what issues we end up finding and then uh, who's you know what what the city feels like is the best way to address those is to how you approach uh, uh, exploring those and it is an exploration because you know it, it's there's things we see asking folks you know asking you know providers how they might want to resolve those and it just opens up the discussion and negotiation so uh, we're not near that place yet because we're still working on figuring out what the issues are but um, but once we know what those are then the city will be working on what are the best ways to address those and what are the steps to take to do that. So I hope that answered the question, but that's a good question. Yeah, and if anybody asks a question, we answer it and it's not satisfied, ask it again or ask it a different way, okay? We appreciate that. Um, so we're just gonna talk a few minutes about uh, why broadband services are so important for Johnston. And, and really, the, a lot of what we're talking about applies to any modern community in the 21st century. There are so many things that we rely on broadband services to provide us in our communities. You know, so, so why does it matter? Well, for one thing, it matters for education. Um, I'll reference COVID a couple of times because it's really, really shown a very bright light on some of the gaps that are present in some areas. Education especially has become an issue as we've had to have a home-based uh, education during the coronavirus outbreak. Um, we've also seen that impact on, on jobs. Not only have more people had to work from home as a result of COVID, but our entire economy is moving toward a work from home uh, being a much more prevalent part of how people earn income. And not just their primary job, but um, additional income earning opportunities that require them to have a, a reliable, fast internet connection. Broadband really matters for healthcare. And I've got a little video I'll show in just a few minutes that talks about telehealth. Um, telehealth may not be something that a lot of you have actually had to deal with or had, had never interfaced with, maybe until COVID. Uh, I had my first telehealth visit here about three weeks ago. And I can't tell you how nice it was to not have to drive 20 minutes through traffic to see a doctor sit in a waiting room for 30 minutes for a 10 minute office visit and a 20 minute drive home. I got online and I was done in 15 minutes and I didn't have to go anywhere. Um, obviously that's not gonna be available for every type of medical care 
and certainly not acute cases uh, where treatment is required hands-on. But telehealth is something that we're all going to be taking advantage of more and more over time. Quality of life is the reason you live in Johnston, Iowa, or wherever you live. People choose to live in a place where they, that they feel offers them the amenities that are important to them. It could be great parks. It could be a fantastic trail system. It could be safety. It could be great schools. Uh, all of these things are quality of life issues. Broadband availability and broadband quality is a quality of life issue. And it is becoming more important in the minds of people in the 21st century. Really broadband matters for every community. And certainly here in Johnston, that is part of the, um, uh, part of the equation. Um, so I wanna talk a little bit about technological revolutions because we really are in the middle of a technological revolution, but it's not the first one that we've gone through. Um, we had another one about 100 years ago, and all of us, none of us were there for that, of course, but we benefit from it every day. About 100 years ago, that technological revolution was electricity. And in the early 20th century, although some areas had electricity in the 1880s or so, it was really not until the 19 teens and 20s that electricity became commonplace and more commonplace in American homes. And in fact, in rural areas, it wasn't until the 1940s and 50s that many farms and rural residences had electricity. It really took about 30 years from when electricity came to the market for it to spread, first in those cities, later in rural areas. And when you think about electricity, it really changed the way we live, the way we work, and the way we play. So much so that all of us take it for granted. We're really living in the next technological revolution and that is broadband. So when you look at electricity, think about how it changed the lives of everybody in America or indeed across the world. It gave us light at night. Before that people could not, in many cases, work after dark because there was no artificial light or it was so poor that it was inadequate for many types of tasks. It gave us refrigeration no more ice boxes, no more cutting ice and putting it in a cave and then hoping that there's still ice in August. Uh, we have a refrigeration run by electricity that allows to keep us to keep food fresh longer. Air conditioning. Yes, indeed, we all take that for granted, but 100 years ago or plus, it was something that most people never even thought of and it changed our lives. Something as simple as cooking without a fire. Um, and of course, entertainment. Without electricity, we don't have radio and later television. We just had stories around the campfire. Broadband's kind of doing the same thing here 100 years later in the 21st century. It's enabling working from home, learning from home, getting healthcare delivered at home, communicating with loved ones across the street and around the globe. And it's also enabling whole new forms of entertainment that even Jack Benny couldn't have thought of when the 1950s and the uh, tel age of television bloomed. And all of those things are happening because of broadband. It allows you to experience those things that your grandparents couldn't even comprehend. So when we talk about why is broadband important, I'm probably preaching to the choir with a lot of you because you live it and breathe it every day. But it is very important to understand just how vital it is to everybody. And Curtis, I would add the uh, it's even more vital for those that are more dependent on the home environment to be their source of either income or entertainment. Uh, it's more of an equal opportunity is what is being brought, uh, just like electricity was being brought and brought a lot of opportunities um, just within the, the general economy. But when a lot of times we, we take for granted that there is a significant part of our population that does not get to fully experience the educational or quality of life that many of us do. And this is providing the next best thing and providing a great equalizer um, as it's adopted. Absolutely. And, you know, as I've mentioned a couple of times, COVID has really brought this into focus because if COVID had happened 50 years ago, the economic impact of that shutdown would have been in many cases, much, much greater than they were because many of us have been able to work from home. Our kids have 
and able to learn from home. Although we know it's not what we want, it's better than no learning at all. Uh, we've been able to have healthcare delivery and all these other things that uh, even things as simple as entertainment uh, have kept us from going a little less COVID crazy than we might have if we didn't have these things. So the pandemic has really made it clear how important these items are in today's world. Um, before I go on from this, I'm going to answer a couple of the questions that have come up. And again, keep them coming in. Um, we have a question, if we live on the edge of the city, will our service be slower or have glitches? We currently find this to be an issue with our current provider. That's an excellent question. And your experience is certainly something that a lot of people find. In many cases, it's, uh, it, it's a matter of the technology that is being used to deliver that service to where you live. Certain types of technology have limitations in distance. So the signal from certain types of networks such as copper-based networks will only go a certain distance. Um, fiber, which is kind of the 21st century standard for telecommunications, fiber has less uh, of that distance requirement. Um, it, you still have to have fiber to your facility or home or business in order to make it work, but distance is not a factor necessarily in, in providing that. So thank you for that question. Um, also, it, a question here, is the city planning on creating a municipal broadband company where the city would run and support the service? I know the city of Waverly did this a few years ago. Um, not to speak on behalf of the city, but I don't believe at this point that is necessarily the end goal of this project. Um, and maybe Todd or Ken can chime in on that, but this project was is, is to try to identify what the gaps are today, and even so we can understand what they might be even after Metronet does its plan build out in at least part of the community. Because at this point, we don't necessarily fully understand if there will be areas that Metronet does not build fiber to. Curtis, I would just say that, you know, at this stage, since we're still in that, uh, looking at the finding what the coverage issues are, that, um, that really what options and things aren't even really being explored yet because right. there hasn't been a real definition of what the concerns and issues are. So, so, you know, I, I agree with everything with what you said, Curtis, I would just say we're, we're early enough in the process that, you know, to know what would even be a viable option to discuss, we just aren't there yet. So we'll have to get there. But that's, so. Sorry about the phone ringing there, folks. Thought I had it on mute. Um, Another, Todd, did you have something? No, okay. Um, I, I would mention too that you are correct. The person asked that question. There have been a number of communities in Iowa that have built their own fiber networks. Um, that is certainly a viable option in some communities. That generally is something that is done as more of a last resort. In other words, nobody else is going to serve that community with fiber. Um, you have a case here where um, apparently uh, according to the plans, uh, you have a, a provider that wants to run fiber in, in Johnston. We just don't know exactly if there will be gaps even after that. Um, another question, curious as to last mile cost to homeowners regarding installation, that is home setup costs. Well, we don't know exactly what Metronet is planning on doing for that, other than the fact that in most cases, when somebody builds a new network, they do not necessarily charge the homeowner um, a, the full price it takes to hook the, to run a line to their home or business. So, um, we, but we don't know exactly how um, uh, Metronet will handle that or how any other provider would handle that because every other provider has its own policies on connection fees, installation fees, things like that. Okay, good questions, everybody. I've got a little video I want to show right now. And this is, um, I mentioned telehealth before. This is a video talks about um, telehealth in the age of COVID and, and why it's been so critical in some areas. The future of healthcare is often portrayed with a robot or artificial intelligence. While some of that is happening on the fringes, the real future of healthcare is emerging right now. And it's happening because of the pandemic. For doctors and clinicians, they've had to quickly hack together solutions so they can continue to serve patients. If their practice doesn't already have an app, they're using Zoom or FaceTime, services that were forbidden to use previously. Now, healthcare companies are seeing astronomical increases in video visits. Other things, like prescription filling, 
have become that much easier. And for clinicians who only used to be licensed to treat patients in their same state, they're now allowed to treat patients across the country. For the first time through a smartphone, people can get efficient, high quality care at an affordable price with good outcomes at a time when people really need that. But the question is, is this here to stay? As we ride the waves of coronavirus and everyone has to use all of these digital tools, will we get used to them? Will we have a better healthcare system with people doing most of their visits from home and only going into the clinic when absolutely necessary? Are we living through a fundamental shift in the healthcare model? Investors seem to think so, as funding for new digital health companies exploded in the first quarter of 2020. I don't believe that healthcare will ever be the same again. You look back a century ago at medicine, and the tools and procedures that people were using seemed crazy. Cocaine is medicine, no gloves for surgery, ambulance by horse. But that was cutting edge for its time. What will our descendants look at now that they'll view as archaic? Will the idea that we regularly went in to see our doctor be laughable? That we waited until something hurt to find out that we had a health problem? That we paid astronomical amounts for the simplest of visits? I'm so proud of the health tech community that we've been able to step up during this time and that we've been ready for it. The losses from COVID-19 are devastating, but hopefully this change in how we deliver healthcare may in the end save millions of lives. Great. Well, we don't want to watch it again though. Maybe the future of healthcare is often portrayed with a robot or artificial. There we go. Thank you very much. Hey, Ken, we had a question that came in here while the video was showing about, uh, I'll, I'll just read it. And if you want to, if you, I know you've been typing an answer while we've been watching the video, but probably something that deserves some attention to the whole group. Considering land nearly obsolete because of wireless networks, will 5G and future wireless technology make fiber obsolete? Certainly a question that we get a lot when we do uh, work like this for communities. We do, we do. And Kevin, that's a great question. And the, the real way to, to answer that or the real way to think about that is um, 5G, uh, particularly there, there's a, and I won't get, I won't get take too deep a dive here and, and bore you to death, but there's, there's a, 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 a macro way of doing 5G and a, and a micro cell way of doing 5G. Um, the goal for every 5G company is to get as much in, into the small cell as they can. And that's kind of what they're pushing out. Uh, so when you see on TV where it says we're covered the nation, that's a lot of macro and very little micro, but they're actually all trying to move more towards micro. Well, all of that, whether it's macro or micro, has to be fed by fiber. To get the capacity they need, to get the speed they need, to be able to do what they want to do, it requires fiber connection. Now, they can do some repeaters, but not many. It has to be fiber to almost every one of those. So we might see a bit of a shift from uh, from where, to where fiber becomes more of a transport for 5G as 5G rolls out. Um, but you really, Kevin, the way to think of it is you can't really think of 5G without thinking of fiber. They just go hand in hand. You just have to have fiber to be able to do 5G. The other thing I would say is once people, people have a fiber connection at their home, I don't see them saying I want to give that up for 5G for, for very many years. Uh, once they have that connection, they're going to be using that connection. They're going to be doing more and more over that connection. And so I don't ever see there's nothing on the horizon right now that says five, that fiber will be obsolete. Um, it may switch on how what the use is, and it may not to a degree, but I don't see anything that says it's going to be obsolete. That uh, brings up an interesting point. There has been an incredible amount of marketing hype about 5G. I mean, you can't watch something on television without seeing... Uh, videos about 5G. The, the 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 wireless marketing company, uh, wireless companies that have done an amazing job of building up everyone's expectations without doing a very good job of explaining what the limitations are going to be on that service. And it will be several years before I think we really understand what it will mean to us. Um, I still believe it's going to be a technology that's going to be great to deliver mo mobile connectivity and outdoor connectivity. When you're in your home or in your business, you're going to be using your wired connection. That's where I think. Hey, it's Curtis, if, if I could just add one more quick thing on that. So we work a lot with uh, 5G um, deployment right now. Um, and just I, I, 
we I can't name names a whole lot, but just just to give you an example, we're working uh, in depth in uh, in Chicago mm-hmm. with uh, a 5G rollout, and I was really surprised. Just, just everybody kind of thinks think about this. I was really surprised that when we were talking about uh, the 5G rollout and what was going to happen with 5G, um, the the big players, the biggest names in all of that marketing hype, those people said, well, we're not quite at that rollout level yet. And what that really means is is there's an infrastructure level, there's an equipment level, and then there's an application level, okay? And so the the infrastructure level is the fiber in the cells. Uh, the, the the equipment level is is all that has to be done to hook up all those cells and you know, all the power and fiber and all that kind of stuff. And the application level is when they're really going to use those. And I was just really surprised to hear these big you know the big names in 5G that are you know have all this marketing hype say, well we really don't have the application level to any major degree yet. I mean you can speed some things up on your phone or you can do this, but as far as where it's really hitting that application level. We just aren't there yet. So, and, and to Curtis's point, I really think that's probably uh, a ways off. Uh, if, they're, if they're just now getting to infrastructure level and to some degree the, the equipment level in like the Chicago's and the New York's and California's, um, the rest of the world's a ways away. Absolutely. Um, go ahead, Todd. Yeah, we do have a couple of questions about uh, both how any type of service improvements can be addressed and also uh, the governor's statement on broadband for the state of Iowa. And I would just like to kind of kind of summarize those two together and say that as we find gaps and part of the study, then the city is going to be more prepared to take advantage of any potential ways by which an investment can be made by the general public um, or by customers or in a partnership. And it's usually through those type of arrangements that you can establish better service quality standards. Um, the, it's only, it's in the communities where it's only left to be a private provider solution that there's not a lot of regulation that can be done um, unless there's a provider that needs some assistance serving areas of the community that they otherwise wouldn't be able to serve. And so that's generally how um, in the industry you get to have some say over um, service quality in the state of Iowa. So one of the questions we had were really centered on exactly what I wanted to talk about next, what makes internet or broadband service good or bad. And it really comes down to some really key criteria that you see on the screen here. Uh, We had somebody make mention that outages, outages are always a big deal with internet service repair Handle times often drives customers from one provider to another. What kind of service level agreements can or will Metronet offer? I think this is something that should be addressed. Well, um, I don't know that we know that regarding specifically Metronet yet. Um, All we do know is that competition um, will improve everyone. Um, And having another provider in the community that will be able to provide a high level of service will uh, force the other providers to either improve that service or lose customers. And so when you look at the criteria on this page, those are the sorts of things that a competitive provider can help improve. Speed on internet, reliability, affordability, universal availability. Again, that availability gap is one of the things that we're gonna help help identify. And then um, something that's a little fuzzier, but I think is extremely important, which is people really want their um, broadband provider to be responsive to their needs and operate in a consumer friendly manner. And people wanna be treated well. And so that, those are the sorts of things that a, an excellent broadband provider will provide. And those are the sorts of things that a competitive marketplace will help encourage all providers to improve upon. So I just wanna spend a minute here just to talk about how to participate in this study because this study is a very important, uh, you play a very important role in it. In addition to everybody who's on tonight, providing their feedback and input, we're also asking everybody to take um, a survey. And if you go to the City of Johnson website, you will find that under the Broadband Visioning Study um, 
article, um, that little um, link at the bottom that you see in the red circle there, that's how to take the study. Now, the, or the survey. So the survey has uh, a number of questions about broadband usage, um, what your experience is with current providers, what, uh, what you like about them, maybe what you don't like about them. Um, you'll be asked to you know, rate them on some of those criteria I just mentioned, like reliability and cost and price. But it also, which is very important, allows us to capture actual real world performance data. So when you take that survey, you'll enter your address in, and then you'll take a speed test. And that speed test will not only measure your upload and download speeds, but some other important uh, broadband uh, characteristics that are important to know about. Um, it will capture them into the file, which can then be put into that GIS software that Ken was talking about to show what speeds are at any individual location in Johnston, real world speeds, because oftentimes those real speeds you experience at your home or business are not necessarily what is being advertised and marketed. Um, again, we want people to certainly take that from a their home or business internet connection. Um, we really encourage you not to take it with your mobile device because then we're really just measuring what the cellular provider data is doing. And we're really trying to measure the performance of the landline services. So um, yes, you can be on your Wi-Fi connection and take that speed test, but we want you to take it from your home or business um, inter wired internet connection, not your cellular connection. A um, couple of questions have come up, which is awesome. Um, cost, somebody just wrote cost. Well, we don't know. Um, that's uh, something that each provider um, provides on its own. Generally though, um, competition does help create an incentive for uh, operators to um, offer services at potentially a more affordable price. Uh, and that's always good. Um, what kind of measures will be used to establish the service level objectives in that the community will demand? That's a great question, Ken. I think I bet I'll let you handle that. <laughs> Thanks, Curtis. Um, so we've had several questions about providers and what the providers will be doing and what, you know, what, what they're going to offer, what their costs will be and that sort of thing. Um, just to kind of, uh, kind of clarify the picture a little bit about how these, about how uh, this folks coming in and providers coming in and offering services, just, just kind of talk about in general how that works. So when there are a couple different things to understand, one is that if a, if a provider comes in and doesn't really want anything from the city other than uh, just we're going to get a permit and, and you know put in infrastructure, then they're really for, for basically um, there's not a lot of, of agreement that's made. I mean, it, it's just they're they're just coming in and putting in their they're 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 putting in all the money. Uh, they're getting permits just like any other infrastructure, just like any other building, any, anything else anybody's doing. Um, and so basically, if, as long as they follow the the, the rules of permitting, as long as they follow the rules of policy, then the city's not controlling anything. Therefore, the agreements um, there's not a lot that's agreed to other than than just following what everybody else follows. If, if, as this process goes, if there's broadband concerns that aren't being met, um, whether that's through current providers or people coming in right now, um, and, and if the city, and seeing those and seeing those, those concerns, if the city uh, decides they, there's a role that they want to play, um, no matter what that role would be, that's when it's more of a partnership, that public-private partnership, and then there can be more discussion of, okay, what are the criteria are going to be, what are the agreements going to be. That also then requires more commitment from the city um, to, to gain more control over agreements and things like that. But just just realize, all I'm just trying to clarify there is it, it kind of depends on how those arrangements with the provider are. Is it an agreement that's being made or is it they're just coming in like everybody else and applying for a permit like anybody else would for any other infrastructure for anything else? Therefore, as long as they follow the rules, they put it in and do the things they want to do. So, so we, we're not to the point of being able to say what those 
partnerships might be, if any, um, because we're still figuring out what the issues are. But um, but, but that's kind of how that will play out, if that makes sense. Yeah, one thing that's really interesting about uh, broadband telecommunications is there really are no um, requirements um, uh, in, in that a provider needs to get the blessing of a city or a, a particularly, uh, you know, a, a particular agreement to operate in a city. Um, it's pretty much up to the provider to go where they want to go. Now, of course, within that, they have to have things like rights of way and permits and that sort of thing. And so like, you know, like they would anybody else, the city of Johnston is working with the new provider as they work with existing providers. So there's really no connection there. And none of us work for any of those providers. We work for the city of Johnston. So we're only looking out for the interests of the city and their mission to make sure that the community has the best broadband possible. Um, here's a question. He calls it kind of a threefer. All right. One is what costs will the city bear? Two, are we offering an incentive to Metronet? And number three, did they seek us or did we seek them? I think those are great questions. I think I know the answers, but um, I don't want to misspeak um, with uh, Adam here uh, on listening in online and helping us run this. Maybe Ken knows all the answers. No, I, I, I think those, uh, those actually kind of um, um, came in kind of separate from our what we're working on. Right. And what I mean by that is the city wanted to make sure that, that we went that we did a study that took into account all that was happening um, and to make sure that the citizens and the businesses uh, and the, the organizations within Johnston uh, were ha ha that we were able to look at those and see with MetroMet or without MetroMet, you know, to see how um, to see or do they have adequate, adequate, adequate coverage? Do they have what they need? Um, and that's, that's really a no matter who's in and who's doing what. It's, it's, do, does the city have what it needs or not? And that's really what we're, we're measuring. And so uh, I think you might get some answers uh, from the city uh, as we're going through here on what, like, particulars with MetroMet. But those really, like, the particulars of that aren't really part of what we're studying. We're studying more is what, what is the coverage? What will the coverage be? And does everybody, does everyone in the city have what they need? And the only way to know that is to measure. And that's kind of what we're doing in this part of it. So um, I, I think you'll, you'll probably get some answers from the city as we're going, but that's not really part of what we're dealing with more of the effects, not how that was set up. Great, great. Thanks, Ken. I think Adam was going to start to maybe explain. Okay. Sure, I can provide a little bit of a verbal context for this. Um, the current Metronet build out plan does not involve any city dollars. Uh, and that plan involves a build out of 90% of the community. I think uh, as we receive additional information from Metronet on their specific plans, um, there may be additional conversations, but we're not anticipating any city dollars involved in the Metronet build out uh, presently. Uh, no incentives are being offered to Metronet as part of their build out. Uh, there is some collaboration as far as working with them on the public utility easements and restoration um, of uh, those easements that will occur as they pour underground and install their fiber. Uh, so we did outline through a plan with them how the city will interact with them, um, will facilitate that build out that will take place in those public right of ways, and the public utility easements. And Metronet, uh, to answer the third part of the question, uh, began conversations with a number of metro cities uh, approximately nine to 12 months ago, looking for uh, cities that were receptive uh, to a new fiber provider uh, and cities that uh, uh, had limited service options currently. And so some of those discussions occurred early on um, as they were seeking partners and the city was responsive and providing them the information that they needed to look closer at Johnston and potentially do the build out here in our city. Great. Thanks, Adam, for that clarification. I'm glad I didn't say anything I wasn't supposed to, but it doesn't sound like I would have countered you on any of that. So um, we now we've kind of reached the end of our presentation. So we just want to open it up to questions. Um, so thank you. We've got a couple of them already here we want to address. Um, what is the timeline for this study? Ken, you want to handle that one? Absolutely. So right now um, we have uh, these meetings as part of the 
community engagement. We've got those through um, the next week or so. Um, that will, uh, for the most part, round out our data. And then uh, we've already got all of the geographic work uh, basically done. And so after we get uh, the survey wrapped up, as we, after we get the, these, these community or the different meetings we're going to have as we get those wrapped up, um, going into the uh, through January to get all that stuff done, and then going into February to get all of the uh, options explored and looked at, and some rough uh, uh, design, high level design done of some options. That'll go into uh, early to mid February, and we should be wrapping up. So we're, we're we're closing in. Uh, another question, um, and I'm not sure we can answer this, but we can throw it out there. Do you know when MetroNet service will start to go live? I believe the answer is they're going to start construction in the spring, but I don't know if we know exactly their timeline. I don't know any more that's been uh, in public record so far. So um, usually a network this size and the size of Johnston probably takes a couple of years to complete. So there'll probably be some people that'll be hooked up sooner rather than later. And that's uh, also something that every one of these projects experiences. Somebody's going to be first, somebody's going to be the last one connected. Um, again, if you have any other questions, we have just a few minutes here that we can uh, stay on the line and answer them for you. Um, I don't have anything new here right now. Um, uh, we did have somebody ask about Metronet if they'll cover their home. And Adam, you know, type the response that Metronet currently in the process of submitting build out plans to the city uh, and to email him if they had questions. So, and I know Ken is part of uh, the work that the study that the team is doing. You'll be trying to look at what the Metronet build out plans are, as well as talking to other providers about what they have now or are thinking about in the future. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, what Metronet is doing is important. Um, and, uh, and we, uh, we will be, as we're getting data on what they're doing, we are incorporating that so that we can see, you know, where even the planned, uh, gaps of that might be, um, and, and, you know, to make sure that the city is able to, to see that as clearly as possible. And, you know, being able to relate that to the survey data provides some pretty important feedback for the city. And so, um, so we're, uh, yeah, that will be incorporated as, as part of uh, making sure we know what's covered and what's not. Great. Uh, question here, as a resident, how can we ensure that our property easements are respected? In other words, using the existing ones, can the city hold them to the existing easements? I think the answer to that is yes. Right, Ken? Yeah, so um, great question. Um, the So that's the... the um, what's the work that's being done right now is no different than any other, uh, but any other permit requirements. And so having it in, in the right of way, having it follow the right of way, uh, that's all part of the permit process and inspection process. And as Adam talked about the build out plans and then pulling permits, um, that's all, all of that, none of this works any differently than the regular permit process. And so, um, if you see that not, uh, working right if it's you restoration not working right or something it's important to let the city know that because uh, if that they they the whatever provider agrees this is what we'll put in this is where we'll put it in this is what the restoration will be according to existing policy and according to some permits and then the city um, inspects that um, but certainly if you see something and you can add the eyes you know because there's only so many inspectors and you know in time and all that that's that's very helpful to the city, but yeah, they have to follow everything they would normally have to follow, and that is all of the existing rules about staying within the easement and restoring correctly. Absolutely. Um, somebody thanking for us, thanking for the meeting. Will there be future meetings to keep everyone informed? Uh, I know that there will be. Uh, we will be doing some one-on-one -on -one and stakeholder meetings with uh, uh, specific groups in Johnston uh, beginning next week. So we'll be meeting with developers, we'll be meeting with uh, small business leadership, that sort of thing. Um, I don't know at this point that there's planned to be another meeting like this, but obviously the report that will be created will be a public record and will be distributed and made available to, uh, by the city through the website. So um, I would say keep watching for more information on that. 
Um, yeah, and we will present the findings, and in presenting the findings, um, oh, okay, uh, you know that, that that's something that everyone should be able to be able to see. Correct. Yep, and that'll be at a probably at a city council meeting or a workshop, and um, the city will probably be taping that or making that available to people on Zoom. Um, earlier, you touched on a municipal ISP. Is that a no? We aren't considering one, or still under consideration? Uh, I think that the answer to that is to be determined. Um, the most of the time when there's a municipal ISP, uh, like somebody mentioned Waverly before and Indianola where Todd lives has one. Usually when there's one, it's because there is no other provider that is stepped forward and is building fiber or is responding to the community's needs. This is a case where you have existing providers, you have a new provider that's coming to town and is, is saying it's going to deliver fiber optic services to 90% of the community. Um, so some of that incentive for a municipal ISP may not be present, but we don't know until the study's done if again, there might be a city role in whatever those gaps are that are identified. So uh, I think that that's one of those too early to tell kind of questions. Curtis, can I answer a couple of questions here real quick? Absolutely. Um, Jim um, asked, I completed the survey before the Mediacom, before Mediacom had announced an increase in speed, should I redo the survey? So we actually, um, Jim, as part of the survey, um, there is a, you know, and this is a more, it's, it's kind of anonymous, but we do track where things are so that so that we can see where the gaps are and see where there could be gaps in coverage. If you actually are getting better speeds, it actually would be helpful for you to retake it. And we actually can tell that. And so that's that's not a big deal on our end. But if, if you have, are getting better service, um, it would be good to retake it. That way we can record that, that the service actually is now. And so that actually would be a good thing to do if you could. Great. And then there was another, um, let's see. I was gonna read, I was gonna address another one. But, um, There's one from a Christopher about potential job growth. I mean, I can, I can go ahead and read that if you'd like me to. Go ahead, go ahead, Chris. Yeah, it's, is part of this project researching potential job growth with high-speed broadband for current broadband business, Johnston businesses, and or ever try to influence new companies to come to Johnson, Johnston, or is that more residential focused in their use cases? I think the answer is all of the above. Yeah. We certainly... Yeah, so, so so Chris, for just so you know, um, there is a residential survey that was out and we've also sent out a business survey. Um, and so we are, we have basically two different surveys that are going out. Um, and so we, we, uh, we're, we're getting good feedback and we really appreciate that. Uh, everybody, just another plug, please, if you haven't taken the survey, take the survey. Um, but we, we have done for residential and for business so that we can see, you know, what's happening. Um, once we get the data back and we see what that data is and we see, you know, the goods and the, the, the where there's areas to improve, um, how the city then wants to use that data, um, I, I, there probably will be different ways they could use it, um, but they will have all of that data. Um, so, um, but, but to directly answer your question, it's both. And, uh, and those are both, both equally important, really, because they're, they're very different in what's happening or very different in um, what they tell us typically, but we, but it's important to have both so that we have a well-rounded picture of what's going on in the community. That, that really includes also when we talk to the developer community, because um, I know I've been involved with uh, Jedco there um, and Johnson through some other arrangements that I have um, as a property manager. And, you know, there's been developers that have complained over the years about not getting access in growth areas. And so that's one of the things that we want to make sure on this gap study that we're talking and, and trying to piece and make sure we're connecting the dots uh, the, where we're hearing things are going to go or where the uh, community sees its growth areas, particularly for commercial and business growth. Um, because in some communities that doesn't get matched up. And believe it or not, um, there's there's gaps in industrial parks where, um, where people, and increasingly some of these bigger employers um, and buildings are expecting to have two sources. 
Right. And so we have to look at this also to make sure that there's redundancy that's built in um, into growth areas. And so that's that's kind of a good thing to be looking at for the next five to 10 year growth, particularly as Johnson has updated his comp plan and things of that nature. And if nothing else, we can at least relay the information of growth uh, areas to the providers that say they're going to be serving various areas. There's also a very strong link between business success and residential broadband. And look at it this way. It's one thing if you've just got great broadband connection at a business, that makes the business be able to do what it needs to do. But if the broadband service in the rest of the community is bad, then it makes it harder for that business to attract and retain excellent employees because those employees consider excellent broadband to be a very important part of quality of life. And so if we wanted our community to grow, grow not only residentially, but in that business community, you really need to be able to check out both those boxes because they really are interdependent. And now with COVID, of course, um, many employers have learned that they don't need people to work in a building somewhere, that they can work from home and be just as, if not more productive. So you're gonna see more and more businesses looking at um, home sourcing their employees. And so that, will be, that would be hard to do if your employee just doesn't have good broadband at their house. So they very much are interrelated. Um, a question here, uh, what structure might be placed near my property? Any above ground structures? I don't know the answer to that. I don't know if we know what MetroNet's plan is as far as how, uh, how they will operate their network um, and whether it will be above ground or underground. Uh, I'm not sure what their design is. Do we even know that yet, Ken? No, no, okay. we don't. Okay. So sorry, we can't give you a definitive answer on that. Uh, a lot of new networks when built today from this ground up are, 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 are literal, are usually built underground, but we just don't know. In the case of what metro that is, I, I will say, Tana or, or Curtis, I will add this. Um, Carol, I, I do want to give a plug into your city leadership that they actually um, have, uh, over the course of this year, they actually have put in some pretty good um, and good solid uh, policies about mm -hmm. aesthetics, um, and so they actually have taken the initiative to do that. So um, that worked through the public works department and your your city leadership. Um, and so to try to help manage that, they've, they've worked on what policies would be good to have in place to, uh, to manage that. So they deserve, uh, they deserve the credit for putting in that work. Absolutely. Um, so, uh, Kevin asked, could individuals living within the Johnston School District, but outside of Johnston city limits, be included or access potential services determined through the study efforts? That's a great question because school districts, as we know, don't necessarily follow city boundaries. I think one of the things that your city leaders will be doing is communicating with adjoining communities. In, the, in your case, in the case of Johnston Grimes and Urbandale and, 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 and maybe others to, um, to make sure that you know, if you have gaps, they may have gaps too, and maybe there can be collaboration there to help fill those gaps. So does our collection system on data provide for that? I but believe we don't restrict what? someone from taking the, the, the survey outside of the study area, which is the city limits. So I think someone could take the survey and we could capture that data, yeah. Yeah, yeah we, 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 didn't, um, uh, we didn't put restrictions on that and we will represent whatever data we get. So. Yep, absolutely. Um, did we reach out to other cities that have Metronet too to ask them about their experience? I'm not sure if uh, maybe Adam wants to chime in on that, if there was any of that outreach. Uh, just so you know, Metronet is building fiber in Ames, uh, Davenport and Bettendorf, Iowa. Um, and they have announced plans in, in a couple of other metro area uh, communities. But um, so Adam, I'll let you tackle that one. Curtis. Uh, yes, the city staff did reach out to uh, members of uh, Ames as well as Davenport. Um, we had good conversations with both communities. Ames uh, network is not built out yet, um, but learned a little bit about uh, MetroNet's work within their right of way and the public easements. Um, generally positive reviews as far as how the build out went. 
um, <clears throat> in Davenport, a couple of issues which are not atypical when uh, a utility company are working in the right of ways, uh, particularly if they're doing so kind of in a widespread manner. Um, so we've tried to tackle <clears throat> how we can work through any of those issues in that letter agreement that the city signed with Metronet. Um, and are generally satisfied that uh, they appear to be a pretty good player uh, in the field of uh, broadband. Just if I could make a, just a personal comment on that. Um, I actually lived in a community that Metronet came in and actually uh, solved some uh, pretty significant problems with, uh, and I, I, that could be a whole other webinar just on, on what, on all of those issues and how Metronet came in, but, um, but I, I just in being part of the community where Metronet came in and worked on resolving some problems, um, and this has nothing to do, I have no ties to Metronet whatsoever, and don't, but, but just of just the personal experiences, they actually did a good job of coming in and, and um, uh, helping take care of some problems that existed. And, and that was at their expense. Uh, and and they, um, they, they were good, they, they handled things very well. Um, so, so I, just on a personal level, uh, I appreciated what they did and how they did it. So that's just, just a personal comment. But. Yeah, I would say that, you know, the important thing is that in this instance, the biggest risk is that um, a growing company doesn't fulfill all of its coverage intentions to the extent, and at least now with the study results, the city will know the impacts Right. Things are not going along because there's so much growth going on in, in the other areas or there's difficulties of that growth, timetables slip. I mean, there's that's just business, but at least the proactive part for the city will be to understand what the, the impacts of anything are in real time and be able to be proactive to head out, head out those problems as opposed to being reactive and uh, citizens not being able to uh, be represented in that so Very yeah good. it's you're absolutely right we we would like to see more cities um doing what your leadership in johnston is doing which is uh, being out front of this issue and um so that when you you know with the presence of a new company coming in that the city will have a lot more information about the environment than most other cities do through this study through the continued uh, work that they've been doing before and will continue after this study. So it's it's really good that it, that this is happening. So um, I think we're out of questions right now. Um, I'm just gonna go back to the screen to show that um, link for the, uh, for the survey. Again, if you haven't taken the survey, we'd encourage you to do it now. Uh, the, the link here will take you to the online survey. And again, there, there will be a number of questions about how you use the internet. Um, your, you'll be asked to provide us with some input about your current provider and how you think they're doing. Um, and you have plenty of opportunity there to type in your comments. If you want to vent a little bit, you can vent a little bit. Or if you want to praise them uh, high and low, you can do that as well. Um, but that other part of that survey, in addition to all of that, is, is that um, speed test, which is going to be very helpful in helping the city identify some of the issues that, that may uh, uh, result even after uh, Metronet has finished their project. So this is the URL, and we encourage you all to uh, do this. Take that survey if you haven't already. We'd like to get a, a few hundred more responses if we can. The more, the better. Uh, because there'll be a better, more representative sample of the community as a whole, which is obviously the goal. So looks like we're out of questions. Uh, thank you to our uh, uh, panelists here, to uh, Todd Kilkoff and Ken Demlo, and of course, uh, everybody at the city, Adam and, and his team that have put this together for us. Um, and we hope you learned a lot. This is being recorded and it'll be put on the city's YouTube page. And so if you have a friend or neighbor or family member that could not watch this and is interested in the topic, they can uh, watch the recording. And uh, we will uh, continue the, the broadband study. Thank you for your participation tonight. And we hope everybody has a fantastic rest of the week and weekend ahead. Thank you. Thank you. All right, Adam.
sounds like that's a wrap. I'm going to go ahead and leave. Thanks, Curtis. Thanks, Ken. Thanks, Todd. Absolutely. You guys have a great night. You as well. Thanks, Adam. Thanks, Matt. Thank David. Matt, good to see your name. Yeah, you're welcome. Have a good evening.